podcast and I'm this episode's guest host James Heather. Coming up is an interview I did with Matt Black, co-founder of Ninja Tune and one half of Coca. We explore his relationship with ambient music via some song selections that have signposted his life also play music from and speak about the At Zero Ambient compilation he put together in aid of the charities Calm, Mind and Black Minds Matter. We discuss and play music from Raichi Sakamoto, Irresistible Force, Colcutt, Steve Reich, Steve Rope and many more and get into the mind of this fascinating artist. The music playing now is Concrete Dreams by Specimens and is also taken from the At Zero compilation, which I urge everyone to check out. Fine, thanks, James. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have you. Great to have you on the show. Uh, on this show, we uh, we talk about the interviewees' history in in music and how their how their life's gone uh, in the in the musical world and uh, with a with a sort of onus on ambient and beautiful music, um, any genre really, but uh, and ambient. And I thought that. You'd be amazing for this, <laughs> because we'll see, we'll see how amazing <laughs> I am. <laughs> but obviously, you know, I've I've uh, had a lifetime love affair with music, and uh, I love to listen to music and, and talk about it as well. So let's dive in. And because uh, you you've uh, produced and made some of my favourite songs in the genre, you know, like Autumn Leaves, and most recently you're obviously putting out this compilation at Nought. At zero, at naught, at zero, at zero, yeah. uh, ambient compilation, which I remember speaking uh, to you about uh, a year or so ago about your initial plans for it, and to see it um, blossom into this massive project with crazy big names must be uh, lovely, lovely for you to see. Well, it has been, uh, yes, quite unexpected to see, as you say, how it's flowered, and of course you've got your. Your good self is featured on the album as well and lots of other luminaries and from you know some of my musical heroes i think we're probably going to touch on some of them in the tracks we're going to play actually so there's yes. a few ambient favorites in there uh steve roach for example and um yeah you know a love affair with music i think if i had that on my tombstone i'd be happy basically <laughs> And what was your original sort of inspiration around doing this compilation? I remember reading in your quote about just how it's helped you in, in recent years, this this sort of beatless, beatless music. And I wondered if you could expand on what really gave you this impetus to to oversee such a such a big project for, for good causes like Mind and Calm and Black Minds Matter. Yeah, I mean, music is something that I've always used to help my well to soundtrack my life and like most people you know my mental and emotional stability is not always uh perfect and it's a bumpy ride being a human being and music's been a huge part of what's got me got me through um i do find when i'm i'm working which is a lot of the time i'm at, at my machine or doing various things you know to make stuff and uh yeah, to, to do my work. I find 
actually instrumental music is easier to flow with. If something's got lyrics in, then I find it demands too much attention. And perhaps I'm not very good at multitasking, so I, part of my attention naturally tunes into that and it makes it difficult to concentrate. So for one thing, ambient music by, it makes less demands on you, so it leaves you more free to concentrate on other things. That's not to say that it's just background necessarily, but it's more that one can choose one's level of attention to it more than one can say with a vocal track, which sort of demands full attention. Fine line, but, isn't it? The, the sort of background thing you just you just touched yeah. upon um, from an interesting song which could be in the background and just something that's background which maybe isn't that interesting, but it's it's a subjective thing, I guess. It's a thing, fine I line. Guess, but yeah. yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons I, I believe that Ninja Tune was so successful with quite a lot of hip creative people in the old days, you know, computer programmers, graphic uh, artists, um, uh, designers, and people who like to have music on, but they don't want something that demands too much attention, I think. But yet they don't just want wallpaper. And I think Ninja Tune in the early days with a lot of our instrumental, more, you know, experimental yet chilled music kind of hit that sweet spot nicely. And that got us a, um, a lot of liking and love from those people. But to go back to the mental health aspect of it, mm. it's about two years ago, I met this young guy um, called Alex and he he was assigned as an assistant to me at an event. And I started talking to him because it's always useful to check out other people's tastes, especially the younger generation. Because I'm 60 now, so it's quite easy to get out of touch with books. Impossible to have the taste of a 20 year old now, basically. And he told me that he did suffer from panic attacks and that he'd found ambient music had really helped him directly with that. And that was a real sort of motivation that made me think like, well, maybe we should build on this idea. If It's not just me that's enjoying the music, it's all sorts of people and younger people as well. You know, maybe ambient music like jazz might be sometimes associated with a sort of more bearded, older generation type of thing, but actually youth like it as well. And there's a lot of pressure on us all, including the youth nowadays, and things like panic attacks and depression and, um, you know, ADHD and other types of mental spectrums, let's say, uh, are much more talked about now. So that was a, a key um, push to do this. I honestly don't know how the younger generation cope these days with everything the social all the social medias and like it, it must it must be hard like we obviously experience a life without all of that and that and there was a, their own challenges but i mean <laughs> well that, i this, i agree this, i agree but on the other hand you know i had ways of making myself pretty miserable uh <laughs> even without social media so i think all peoples all times all humanity have sets of challenges to deal with i, I don't necessarily think it's clear that it's harder nowadays to live than it was before. But I think there are significant new challenges that can be really fucking tough because there's no roadmap for them. So, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. This compilation is in aid of these these three charities. And I just wondered uh, if you'd just, I'm sure we'll play a few track as, tracks as the show goes on, but is there a, a track you'd like to play now? I think, uh, the, you know, the first track on the album and the first track on the mix is the... Reichi Sakamoto, Aqua. And I'd like to play that because it's a beautiful piece and a good and fitting start to the, the record. Um, and, you know, reaching out to different artists and reaching out to Mr. Sakamoto, who I did meet many years ago in the 90s, who has always been a bit of a supporter of Ninja Tune, actually, um, but I haven't spoken to him for years. And, uh, you know, to get an, an exclusive, which means a new track that's not being released from artists, is always quite a big ask. Yeah, because it can't just yeah. Be, yeah, it can't just. It's okay to get a track that's been out that they can just license that, but a new track, it's like, well, a new track is a new thing in the spotlight. You know, I and I'm not just going to release any old thing that I've got lying in the cupboard because if it's not very good, that won't reflect well on the artist. So we, we um, I'd found this. Um, uh, YouTube performance that mm. Sakamoto did called, called Playing the Piano for the Isolated. And I listened to that and I thought, well, maybe 
we could get permission to use something from this because although it's been on as a performance, that was a one-off and it's not actually been released. So I suggested that idea and um, they came back and said, yeah, that can work. And Mr. Sakamoto chose the track Aqua for the, the album. And I think it's an ideal track, sort of that crystalline beauty. It's sort of, you know, it's not happy, it's not sad. It's what At Zero is about is a kind of, as I said, a balance point. It feels very pure, the song, very quite innocent and pure, actually, this particular song, because he, some of his music is brilliantly dark as well. But this song yeah. sounds very pure and innocent in a very, lovely way. Very, very pure. But I mean, you know, as you know, being a pianist and making your own <laughs> solo piano, I mean, solo piano, I mean, James, when you played me your stuff a few years ago, I actually think it was one of the first people to say, you know, I think this is really good. And this is the kind of music I do. I actually listen to myself at home. Um, you were one of the first people to yes. feedback on it and and that, that, so, that was brilliant to get that feedback yeah. at the time yeah <laughs> so it's it's it, you know i don't play piano i still i'm still thinking of getting a piano which people are sort of throwing out nowadays because they don't have space so you can get a nice <laughs> a sort of regular piano for almost nothing and i do have a house big enough to put one in so it's just the the dedication and the time of of learning it but you know something that's difficult like that sometimes things that are difficult are good especially for cognition so you might find yet yeah, i'm following in your footsteps and trying to tinkle the, i'd love to hear arteries. it there's a there's an amazing <laughs> piano restoration center in twyford actually near twyford right. uh, brilliant if you ever want to buy a like a restored grand or something um wow. or, to your spec to your spec basically and I, I, you know, I i've always loved the sound and it's funny because we were quite a musical family but we didn't my parents didn't play instruments, but we used to sing quite a lot. But then my sister was the one who had piano lessons and we got a, a piano for her to play. And I used to just go in and just sort of keep playing the bottom note. <laughs> just so, because <laughs> I just thought the sound was so, yeah. so the, uh, the lover of bass. The lover of yeah, bass. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, exactly. The bass was already there. That was just a sort of, as a kid really, but you know, um, piano, I sort of regard it sort of as the, sometimes think the piano is like the queen of instruments and maybe guitar is the king, if you like. I don't know, it's a silly uh, statement perhaps, but um, I think piano is a wonderful instrument and I think this is a wonderful track. Yeah, so this is uh, Raichi Sakamoto with Aqua from playing piano for The Isolated.
it was quite astonishing to come across that performance by Sakamoto there, which was already about the idea of using music as a benefit for mental health in, this, in the, the COVID time of isolation. So I think um, he wanted to support what we were doing because we were basically on the same page. And you mentioned that, because I know he did a remix, I can't remember the release right now, but he has done a remix on Ninja Tune or uh, in the 90s. Uh, so there was that connection, as you say, and you mentioned you'd met him back in the day. Uh, like what was yeah, he, the, any well, nice he, anecdote he, around that? Or? Well, just that he came into Ninja Tune around the time when we released that track. And um, Oh, really? I didn't, we didn't were... know that. I didn't know. Well, I that thought was when... I knew most of Ninja's history, because um, for anyone who don't know me, I work at Ninja with, with Matt. But, uh, I well, that didn't, was in the I real old that. days. That was yes. in the real old days of when we were in Winchester Wharf, London Bridge. Yeah, and he happened to be in town and came in to to uh, meet us. And yeah, it was you know, it's a cool geezer. We also know Harumi Hosono, who's his partner from Yellow Magic Orchestra. Yeah, we've met up with him in in Japan, and he's another you know oddball genius type <laughs> who had has had a huge impact on music and is another sort of musical uncle to to the whole of what we do, if you like. I remember my dad had the Yellow Magic Orchestra albums on vinyl, which I used to, when I walked out of my bedroom as a kid, they'd all be on the, uh, he had them outside my bedroom door, the vinyl, and I was, I was obsessed with Yellow Magic Orchestra as a kid. And so, <laughs> that was Great my sense of humor, those guys. To, to Raiji, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to, to go back, uh, if that's okay. I always like to ask the interviewees about first memories of music, any genre, but if it can be ambient, great. But um, any genre, like earliest memories of, you know, three, four years old sort of thing. Well, as I say, my family uh, have always loved music and used to play a lot of music, although not play instruments. But they had a pretty cool record collection. I remember particularly um, hearing the soundtrack to the musical King Kong, which was this incredible South African musical with um, uh, uh, Hugh Masekela and Miriam McCabe uh, uh, in, in, in the cast and we used to sing those songs some of them were, didn't actually play the records that often I sort of learned them from mum and dad singing them and we used to sing a lot and also got to say you know soul artists often say well of course it was gospel the church that got me started I used to really like singing hymns at school not very really cool mm. to admit it perhaps but you know there's some good stirring Good stirring melodies in there, and I, I loved singing and sort of belting it out. And then I had a, a house master at my school, Mr. Palmer. He was a maths teacher, but he was also the choir master. And he used to, you know, encourage us to sort of. It's quite experimental as, as the sort of choir masters go with some strange, uh, strange things he used to try out. And, and the, the um, I remember what was that? He was sort of opera operatic version of Nip Knack Paddywhack Give the Dog a Bone was a, a particular <laughs> oddball favourite. But yeah, Mr. Palmer sort of encouraged my interest in music and singing. And um, and then, yeah, mum and dad's other favourites were Autumn Leaves, for example. That was a song that my mum and dad used to sing quite often. I learnt it from them without ever hearing the record. And then later decided to cover that and do a, a yeah. version of it. Um, so that was a Joseph Cosma original vocal, I think, in the 50s, wasn't it? But it's been recorded so many times. But when I heard your version, that was the first version I heard as a 20 year old. Right. And I, I thought you guys, you and John wrote it, basically. <laughs> Sadly not. Sadly not. <laughs> uh, but, you know, actually with that and Walk a Mile and The Only Way Is Up, cover versions have been quite good for Cold Cut, really, as John and I are not particularly songwriting is not a strong point necessarily where we've written the odd one and ultimately that's quite an interesting history because it was originally a poem in french called fouille more dead leaves mm. and then it was set to music and then it was translated into english and then another verse was added because uh the whole i think it's the bit autumn leaves fallen and swept out of sight that that's not in the original so it's interesting that actually even a song can evolve between languages, between po po poetry, spoken word and, and melody. And 
the compilation ends with a new, a re-remix of Mixmaster Morris's remix of Cold Cuts, Autumn Leaves. And um, we were signed, we, this was before Ninja Tune, we got into a rather horrible um, contractual situation with Arista. And they wanted to you know his singles and um, we'd done Autumn Leaves. And they were like, look guys, we think it's great, but you know, we don't think it's gonna really cross over. So what if we speed it up to 120 BPM and put a house kick on it? Do you think that would be good? I was like, fuck that, over my dead body. But here's another idea. Let's get Mixmaster Morris to remix it. Because I knew Morris quite well and he's you know, he was a always playing the incredible ambient music and um and so that happened. Morris took it and made this sort of symphonic masterpiece out of it. Using, you know, a lot of the elements from the original because the original had all these strings which were recorded at Abbey Road with mm. a proper string orchestra and um, the, uh, what's he called? Simon from um, Penguin Cafe Orchestra. Um, Simon Jeffies? Jeffies? Yes, Simon yeah. Jeffs, that's right, yeah. Like Jeff. is, uh, He's it's dead now. He's doing music now, yeah. Arthur still runs, mm. yeah, does Penguin Cafe. Um, and uh, Ed Shermard did the arrangement. And, you know, so we got this sort of incredibly glorious, so quite avant-garde string arrangement for it. But, you know, if you want strings, proper string section recorded at Abbey Road, is that is absolutely the top thing you can get. So then Morris was able to play with those elements and mix them with electronics and do something quite extraordinary. And, you know, that album, that whole album, which was called Philosophy by Cold yeah. Cut, is sort of, was probably a bit cheesy and has kind of been lost, but just that remix from Morris is the one thing that's Seminal. survived. That's, yeah. yeah, that's sort of stood the test of time. So we thought we'd give it a lick and a, uh, a polish up. And luckily Morris had printed the all the extra parts on the 24 track tape, which we then had digitized, so we've got the parts to play with. So that was cool. And uh, we did we did a house version of another track from the album and that did quite well as well, but that's long lost in the past. And, um, you know, each time, <laughs> autumn is always coming, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> as indeed it is at the moment. In fact, I was just out with my wife yesterday, driving around, sticking the iPhone out of the window on slow-mo and recording, filming some, glorious coloured leaves in the uh, countryside oh, around where we live, which I'm going to use in the film version which we're doing. That, that's great to hear the background on the track. So yeah, let's have a listen to The Irresistible Force and Cold Cuts, Autumn Leaves Return.
And and Matt, is there a is there a song in your picks today that sort of remind you of the the childhood, your yeah. childhood growing up in music? Yeah, school days. I mean, this is the early seventies, and I'm not in love. By Ten CC came out, and it was just a mind blowing track, and just the whole sonic of it was un completely unlike anything that I'd ever heard, and I think anyone else as well. I've read up on the story of how they put that together, and it's a pretty incredible, interesting story, actually. They're really pushing out that what could be done, done technically. But it's funny, I was at um, a rather fantastic uh, audiovisual show at the Barbican last night, done by Vicky Bennett, who's, she calls her, her, her posse's called um, People Like Us. And she did this incredible audiovisual cine chamber piece with projections on all four walls. And she did this really good montage of sound and visuals and halfway through it, it the sort of ah uh, those gorgeous choral pads from 10cc and i thought oh god she's going to play it and then she kind of slurped off into somewhere else but it was a masterful bit of montage <laughs> anyway that track was a mind-blowing track and it's you know i do love things which are sort of avant-garde in that they're not really they outside the box of what's happening and yet they still can achieve commercial success. I think when something's sufficiently brilliant and fresh and yet accessible, it can that that's the, the ultimate challenge really. And they totally killed it with that. You know, it, yeah, it's a um, say sort of perfect avant-garde pop track really. And yeah, well, still trying to produce a sonic that's as beguiling and out there as that. It feels like one of those songs that even as people don't know 10cc it's one of those songs you feel like everyone knows that song the melody like if yeah, they hear it they, they've, they've, yeah. it's got lodged in their brain somehow it's so catchy it's got it's gone into the canon hasn't it you know like yeah. a lot of motown stuff that even kids that were nowhere weren't even born till decades afterwards still somehow know it and um 10cc an interesting bunch of people actually after they had quite a lot of pop success with their, their songs, they went into a sort of experimental video production and I was just digging on some of their experimental stuff on, on YouTube where they were doing kind of AV and twisting visual effects out in a quite punky sort of DIY way. So I'd like to meet up with those guys, definitely some heads. Yeah, so let's listen to uh, 10cc and I'm not in love. Thank you. 
you were talking then Matt about the 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 early visual experiments that Tennessee C were doing and I was really curious to talk to you about early ambient electronic nights like obviously I know you're at Stealth which is a bit before my time but I so wish I was there but maybe going back a bit is it a bit before telepathic fish telepathic fish telepathic fish yeah yeah that Kev put on and uh yeah I'm, I'm assuming you played there and was that lots of ambient visuals and if you could talk yeah. about those early electronic rave days and well you know space-time continuum fluorescence is for me is one of the seminal kind of brilliant minimal ambient tracks and i never get tired of playing with it i got to know jonah sharp later on and uh, he's a good friend of morris's and um he told me that he composed that track when his youngest son had just been born and jasper his name is was uh sleeping in the studio in his cot and uh, Jonah was made this track but at the same, around the same time telepathic fish was going on and they were a bunch of art students from Camberwell um, Dave Villiard um, Mario Aguera who ended up doing some pretty cool software with Hex Chantelle who became Mira Calix on Warp Records a very interesting avant-garde ambient artist herself um, and of course Strictly Kev who is took over the DJ food mantle mm. and also, you know, created the most memorable uh, iconic graphics for Ninja Tune, which have been such a big part, I believe, of our success. So they were a pretty funky little posse and they put on these squat parties in Brixton. Uh, and I ended up, um, I, I, they wanted me to DJ, but I was not really feeling DJing at the time, And but I was more into mixing visuals. So I took my little Epson office video projector and um, 
couple of VHSs and my old Amiga and went down and set up at this squat in Tunstall Road. And that was a really amazing party. And I hadn't taken acid for about 10 years, but I took a tab that night and it really was like waking up again to, oh yeah, I almost forgot what things are about. This is, this is it, this is real. This is um, an alternative consciousness shared with all these people here who are on a similar tip. And we're really digging deep into or into music as a as an experience, but not in a normal ravey party whack McDance kind of way. That was I remember Kev taking the decks and taking DJ Food albums and really cutting and scratching them up. It's like, yes, at last, this is why we made these records to be used as food by DJs to be, you know, chewed up and remade in different forms. And then Morris came on after him and just, you know, it was just mind blowing. Mixing visuals along with Morris, that was the first time I did it. And um, it was, it, it, one of the things that it did for me was made me realize how powerful the DJ was in the position of providing the soundtrack when people were tripping. If people are in an enhanced psychedelic state, you've really got a responsibility to provide them with something nourishing and, and appropriate and, and beautiful and, and good. Um, uh, uh, and Morris did that, and I just remember saying, "Wow, I never dreamed that you know tripping with Morris could be so in intense." And and uh, and then people were coming up to me as well as whilst I was mixing the visuals, and going like some of them would come up and say, "Wow, yeah, the music's really great, man. This is incredible." I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, "Well done, well done." It's like, yeah, yeah, nice one. And then some couple of people might say like, hey, look, I really don't like the music. I say, I'm not doing the music, I'm doing the visuals, that guy's <laughs> doing the music. <laughs> yeah, people didn't know what a VJ was, I guess. No, and they then. didn't, but they didn't, but, um, you know, respect to sorted Phil, who, when the projector bulb blew, got on a ladder in the middle of the, the floor and, you know, we were all tripping our nuts off, got the projector down, replaced the bulb and got it going again. And a big cheer went up when the visuals came back on with the, various uh, psychedelic telepathic fish stuff we were doing on. So that was that was a seminal party. And that was, um, you know, where, where I met Kev and he later, you know, joined us at Ninja Tune and also yeah. Mario as well. And of course, David did the the visuals for Morris's um, it's Tomorrow Already album, which we released a couple of years later. So that was a sort of seminal junction point for me, Ninja, Ambience and Psychedelia. I was listening to a pirate radio station from my older neighbour at the same time. But I was only about 12 or 13, but when I came to London in 2000 and people told me about the nights that you were at and stuff, it just seemed like a really special time for music with all these ideas coming together. And I, even though I wasn't there, I feel like I was there because I just love the music so, yeah, so much. I feel like that, that about sense. the 60s. I feel like yeah. that and the, and the crowd rock time. I was sort of spiritually, I was there at those jams, you know. Now, was there a time that the, the ambient room, which was often in room two, I guess, when it almost mm. merged and it became the main room in some way, not ambient, but just it, it didn't have to be banging beats the whole time. It was uh, people a little bit more tended, experimental. Oh. Well, that's a nice theory. It tended more to be the other the other way around. Okay. Sort of <laughs> bollocks music killed the chill out room on many occasions, I'm so, sorry to say. because People just couldn't help sort of putting something with a beat on. And then when you get people dancing, it's like, oh, well, this is good. I better put something else on. Before you know it, you're playing fucking four on the floor house to, you know, and it's just like the other room, which was not the idea. The Ninja's whole philosophy was about being the alternative to the main room, if you like. That we, that had to be a philosophy, otherwise it's just monoculture. So that was our sort of starting yeah, point in a way. Not that I had anything against. Well, that's right. And you know, John and I loved house music. Right? We were there at the beginning. You know, people hold on, Doctor in the house, and you know, mm. those original tracks anyway um that you know a space for an alternative an ambient is quite an extreme alternative you know, the the big chill you're talking about the sort of early days of ambience you know the big chill parties at the union chapel were incredible because it was pretty much 100 percent chilled music um, and initially it was just ambient. So I can link that to another track I wanted to play, which is Steve Reich, Music Creating Musician. So a couple mm -hmm. of stories with that. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that track until one day, John and I were invited to go on a pirate station called Network 21. Um, and these guys had also done pirate TV, which I thought was a very exciting 
idea. And so we were in their sort of council block in South London somewhere to about to do this show. Now I had the show on Kiss as did Jonathan and I was used to doing my sort of master mix dance party and playing quite funky, soulful tracks. Um, and, but I sort of understood that that wasn't quite appropriate for this and that this was somehow had a more arty angle to it. Um, and I, I said to John, I don't know what to play. What should we do? And he said, don't worry, I know what to play. And he put on music for 80 musicians. And the nice thing is it's quite, it's really nice and long. So it gives you time. So I was like, well, this is incredible. What's this? And then John played it. And then, then he mixed out a bit into this, um, this Lee Scratch Perry track, dub track. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Just by playing these two records one after the other, you've made a link between two completely different sorts of music that yet mm. you can draw some links between it, the repetition, the subtle change, the de-emphasis de on the vocals, the, the um, yeah, structures, musical structures of a somewhat unconventional kind. Um, and I thought it was a really um, spectacular example of how a DJ can make a point just by playing two records one after the other. So after that, I was like, I've got to find out about this record. So I, I found out about Steve Wright, Music for Eighty Musicians, got my, my copy of it. And um, it's be become maybe my favorite ever piece of, of music. So influential um, so, track, yeah. So then, you know, if you thought that was in whenever it was, like 1989, maybe 98, yeah. And then fast forward a couple of years, I got to know Pete Lawrence. Um, Stuart Warren Hill, of Hexstatic, was doing his own parties called The Ambient Club, actually, up in Muswell Hill. Went to a couple of those and I was amazed to find another head doing sort of punky graphics on his Amiga computer. So we bonded on that. And then Pete Lawrence pulled us in for The Big Chill. I went to the first one at the Union Chapel and Pete was rush, rushing around like a mad one. He's like, Matt, I'm supposed to be DJing, but I'm too busy. Have you got any records here? Can you do it? I was like, well, actually I do. I happen to have some records in the car. Yeah. You know, good DJs always got some vinyl, <laughs> got, got some music on. Nowadays a stick would suffice, but I did have a box of vinyl in the car. So I pulled it in and I was like, right, what the fuck should I do here? Okay, right, music for 80 musicians, that'll do. So I stuck that on and sort of skinned up because it's nice and long and give me a chance to ponder my next move. And I ended up playing at the next um, 14 big chill parties. And I really dug that whole scene of, um, you know, It was a, a great of... festival. I only went to some of the yeah. middle, middle ones to late, but, yeah, it, but was, it was great. This, this was even before the first Black Mountain big chill festival. Yeah. These were the events at the Union Chapel and everyone was relentlessly skinning up and, you know, it's just totally still illegal. Um, as it is now, but no one seemed to care very much. But they were just really there to sort of have this lovely expanded giant living room. Um, and then I found this guy who could rent me a cheap projector. So I used to take that down there. We had a couple of projectors. Sorted Phil, Phil Meyer, another good friend of mine from the early VJing days. He regularly came down to the Big Chill as well. Uh, I think I mentioned him from the Telepathic Fish Party. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we were experimenting with this idea that electronic mix, mixing, elec mixing visuals of all different sorts was a good, the, the idea that mixing visuals together using visuals of all different sources, animations, nature footage, old film, whatever, in a kind of montage way was a natural kind of, had a natural relationship with the idea of music montage of, of hip hop and also that electronic visuals and electronic music belong together and that some of the aesthetics and techniques could be kind of cross-linked to each other and that that's an idea which Kolka have been playing with and investigating uh, over the last more than 30 years now and it's been a very fruitful um, direction to take and I'm still really passionate about exploring that, those relationships. I call it AV, the art of audio, audio, AV, the art of audiovisual relationship. What are the different ways in which sound and image can relate to each other? And um, yeah, so it's a big, uh, a vast field for, for study and playing in. And uh, we should play Steve Reich in a minute, but yeah, I, I, as you were saying about the visuals and a lot of what you do is 
I've noticed is when you make art, you like to make art that people can also make their own art with. Do you like to make things that people can get involved with themselves yeah. through? Like I've noticed a theme throughout your work is it's not you're not just making something for, for you to do. You're trying to you're make right. stuff that people can also remix, remix, remix of what you've already done. And it's very collaborative yeah. what you what you do. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, quite an important thread to what Cold Cut have been about. And, um, you know, part of it is the idea that, you know, if we all got were having fun making music and making art, we'd be too busy to do boring stuff like fighting each other and, and arguing. You know? <laughs> so it, it, it's for the love. Also, I, not being a musician myself, um, a certain little chip on my shoulder about it in a way it's like actually anyone can be a musician anyone can be an artist and the kind of elitist idea that this is only available to a few number of small yeah. number of privileged people is something i think that needs to be challenged and by helping people get access by making tools where you can just have a go and make something i think it, it helps um challenge that that sure. elitist position for sure, Matt. Yeah, I totally agree. It's really inspiring um, what you do and, and connecting with people who might not have that access. Well, I just want to give a plug to our latest uh, toy or play tool, as we sometimes call them, which is called Ninja Jam, or just Jam for short. Ninja Jam is the free version of Cold Cuts Beat uh, app. Then you can get it for Android and iPhone, and it's free. And then there's a pro version called Jam Pro. And when Cold Cut do live shows or I do my pirate TV show, that's what I use as my instrument. So kind of cooked up all the cold cut functional technological insight and technique and put it into a, something that you can play with on your phone uh, i think it's pretty cool it, it was really interesting hearing about the steve reich and when he first played that at the very first big chill at union chapel so let's give it a listen at steve reich and music for 18 musicians Thank you. 
And Matt, is there another uh, track you'd like to um, play today? Some uh, inspiring track from the ambient type world? Around the year 2001, I had a, a sort of psychedelic religious experience. Um, and uh, I won't go into it, but it did was sort of the most profound, important experience of my mind. And I've still been, the last wow. 20 years, I've still been trying to understand it. Um, wow. And uh, it's centered around Krishna, mm. who one could just regard as a name for the collective intelligence and love of the universe. Um, but that um, put me on a, a quest to search for meaning and other, an insight into that and came across a lot of other art and music, which had obviously been made by musicians and artists who were also um, deep into that spiritual quest and I'd have put up some pointers and some milestones. And one track that I came across was Coming to Knowledge by Ramp, which is the Roy Ayers music project. Mm. So I'd like to play that. Have you heard the, uh, I'm sure you have, but the the Alice Coltrane years when she was in the, the Ashram. Sure. And, and yeah. uh, a lot of those were just done on cassette tape at the time for people yeah. there. And they've since been released. And I think it's some of kind of, I, they're my favorite bits of her music actually. Yeah. It's funny, I mean, religion's not very trendy nowadays because people want to distinguish between religion and, and history. Um, but spiritual spirituality is sort of, people prefer to use that term now. But, you know, I sometimes joke that re religion is the hangover the morning after revelation. But that what is good there is that quest to try and, achieve break out of our fixed ways of thinking and negative ways of thinking and achieve a higher consciousness and in that track it says come into knowledge of the spiritual law people you find out who you really are and Beautiful. that that puts the the promise of of music if you like into a line there which i find uh, extremely moving and inspiring and you know on on the I'm 60 now and in my 60 years I've been on this this trip as we're all on our trips and every so often to come across sort of way stations that where there's some nourishing fodder and 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 sustenance and water for the, the thirsty and hungry traveler uh it's what it's what keeps keeps us going so that is a lovely track yeah, let's listen to it. So it's a ramp and come into knowledge.
I was reading an article recently um, by a journalist who who went to a meditation retreat and he met someone who'd been there many years who used to be into music, a musician who said, just they don't listen to any music now whatsoever because they find it that it, it's too um, influential on what telling the brain what to think. But and I can definitely see that um, that angle because yeah, I mean it's very powerful music and it can tell you what to think so you have to be careful what you're listening to and when you listen to it so i can't yeah. ever imagine never listening to the music though right can you no. i mean that's to me that's like saying i've decided that i'm never going to eat yeah you know, <laughs> because food could, could be poisonous you know but to, i'm very um careful about my cultural diet mm. you know it, i don't like violent films if the film has violence in, but it's, there's still something uplifting or important that that is saying that I need to know, I can deal with it. But a lot of films that I find too violent and a lot of things I just find not good nutritional sustenance. We are what we eat, they say. Yeah. And this also applies to cultural nutrition. So I'd agree that um, music is, you know, a strong food and, um, and, and a powerful thing and needs to be handled with respect and one needs to be discerning as with everything in life to try and you know take in what is truly truly good yeah well said and um is there another track i just want to make sure you definitely get to play your picks today matt so uh, is there another is there another track you'd like to play yeah that could segue quite nicely into irresistible force fish dances um, this is a Mixmaster Morris track that's on the Ninja Tune album. It's tomorrow already, and it features the voice of Alan Watts. The lyric there, and um, Alan Watts's uh, message and observation on spirituality, I found very moving and and uh, and inspiring. And you know, Morris, like Cold Cut uses quite a lot of spoken word. And I was talking with him about this the other day, that in some ways we've just used it as kind of bohemian hipster signifiers. You know, Alan Watts was a cool guy, or James Brown's a funky voice, and that's why we use these things. But, you know, it, it actually, if you listen to John Hopkins' new record, for instance, mm. he's using the voice of Ram Dass, who wrote uh, Be Here Now. Um, and it, it isn't just used as a sort of tokenism hipster thing it's used because John's chosen that because that's something that he wants people to pay attention to and in this actually Alan Watts's voice is saying some pretty deep and intelligent and moving stuff so it's not just a, a cool bit of spoken word it's actually a message and Morris is using the spoken word to give a message to what he's doing and you know um, I read the sleeve notes to the record he sampled for that and uh, it's sort of where well, it ties in a way to the experience that I had. Um, in Hinduism, they say, Tat Dvamasi, which means thou art that. That God that we're looking for, that divine that we're looking for, that, that something else that's greater than us. We are already that. If, if we can just recognize it in that moment, then that drop, which is you, becomes the ocean, which is the totality. totality. It's no different. Tatvamasi, thou art that. You and mean it's inside what, you? It is there, even we, if you we can't are, find it? We are it. Humanity is divinity. You know? mm -hmm. And um, it's that quest to realize that, which means to live in a way that lives up to that. That is the challenge, I believe, that that's sort of what, what we're here for. And that's what Alan Watts is talking about in that track. You, yes, you are the apple on the tree. You are, are that thing that you're seeking for. Um, so, uh, yeah, well worth a listen. Let's give it a listen. So it's Irresistible Force with Fish Dances featuring the, the, the spoken word of Alan Watts. <laughs> You've always been our own. And always will be. You and 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 you and
is the same as the you in me. You belong Like the apple on the tree. And as the apple is the energy of the tree. You, yes, you are the energy of the world. You can't have an apple. Without a front. Or a light day. The whole thing is
go to some more of your picks matt um i noticed there's another cold cut song on the uh, at nought compilation um mm-hmm. the fire burns out and i just wondered uh, is that a new track you and john have worked on or is it something you'd done before uh, what's the story on that track yeah the fire burns out is a brand new cold cut track uh, made entirely by jonathan actually um mm-hmm. And it was kind of the first new track that he's made for a little while. Um, and I think he made it entirely with sort of Ableton preset sounds because he didn't have any other equipment <laughs> with oh, him, right. just his headphones and his laptop. And, um, yeah. and he put that together, which is pretty impressive, really. He also told me he used Midivolve, which is Cold yes. Cut's little Ableton kind of arpeggiator on steroids thing. So I was happy that he was enjoying that. It's um, gone well, hasn't yeah. it, Midivolve? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's been a good little learn. It's my first, first software product that's actually ever made any done anything other than lose money but it's just people people have um, been enjoying it and we're using it for tracks as well so it's a brand new track and uh, i really think it's quite an unusual track with it sort of definitely falls in the neoclassical uh, yes. department that i think mm-hmm. um, for sure. so yeah that's a, a new track and there's a couple of my tracks under various aliases on there as well. oh really oh yeah. are you, can you reveal any or yeah, sure. There's double double cushion is an alias, and that's um ah, track for. I'm wondering who double cushion was. Yeah, that's that's me, and that's um, tracks called uh, for Ignatz Carmelito, and he was a friend of mine from Goa, he's a Russian keyboard player. He he's, he died a couple of years ago, and uh, he was a beautiful soul, and I, I miss him, and I jammed with him in Goa, and it's got some of the sounds from that jam in that in that track, um, and then another track that also I mainly did whilst I was in in India um, is the um, Bandra Tanpura with uh, some sort of modular synth young friends of mine from Bombay um, and Sandeep Mishra on uh, 
Serengi as well mm -hmm. and uh, Tempura recorded at a studio in, in Bandra Bombay uh, with Darren Sangita who's he's also got a track on uh, there as well under the name New Dream and Darren's one of my best mates and a really cool musician his thing is music for full spectrum piece mm -hmm. so Sangita sounds check him out as a, a wealth of music I think on Bandcamp and um, so he's found his way on there as well initially it was just going to be me and some of my mates because I didn't think it possible to get bigger names on it but Adrian Kemp at Ninja Tune suggested that we you know it was as it was a good project and we were doing it for charity and Cold Cut were asking maybe some other people would respond as and he was right they did and he's basically got a who's who of the ambient world uh, uh, on, on there as well as as well as um people you've performed with in as you say in India it's a, and it's a pretty good selection isn't it you know with Ski Mask and Helena have there as well on the more sort of you know, electronic <laughs> tip and not necessarily known for doing ambient music but uh, you know I think it, it weaves together pretty well really is there is there another pick from your choices Matt you'd like to play today I'd like to play King Tubby meets Rockers Uptown and uh, this is the dub version of Baby I Love You So um, from Jacob Miller I think but better known probably from the dub version and King Tubby was this incredible Jamaican innovator who's one of the people who invented dub really and just I used to have this great cassette with uh, that album on one side and another one King Tubby meets Rockers in a Firehouse on the other side and I just used to play this, this tape again and again and something that I put on when I was feeling down and um, just it's just so warm and um, yeah it's something very organic and simple yet beautiful and uh, I don't think I can define it actually it's just one of the things that's got me through it's been that album. remember in the in the 2000s around Christmas you and John used to go around the Ninja Tune office 
there's only about 15 of us then or something but uh, mm. you used to give us all a cd like a mix you made a mix for us all and um yeah uh, once a year and it's before sort of itunes really is you know still cd era and uh, i yeah. used to take that cd home and there'd be a lot of dub on it but at my young age i wasn't that aware of yet yeah really like proper digging you'd done to, some of these tracks weren't um completely well known but they're all all totally on the money and uh, mm, thank you well, i mean before yeah. the cds there were there were a few years of christmas cassettes as well yeah um so yeah well, we like we like doing a mix and you know, uh it, it's funny I, I still find it funny that people talk about mixtapes because quite often they they're usually not tapes and usually they're not even mixes but um in the old <laughs> days we did proper mixed tapes so bring back the mixtape actually i haven't got a cassette deck anymore so i can't really can't really talk <laughs> i prefer prefer my digitals yeah well king tubby's mix rock up town let's have a listen to it you know we we brought out um ninja's first ever effect unit uh whenever it was november 2019 i think um wow it's two years ago already can that be right yeah. i think it is because we've had the interval in between haven't we yeah but yeah th that is intended as a dub delay line basically the zen delay um, and you know these King Tubbies and that sound was very much in my mind when I was trying to work on it to design a unit with Dr. Walker, <laughs> Ingmar, Dr. Walker, and me put the, put the design together with Erica since. And the idea is to do give people a good dub dub box basically. I want to um, when I've got my all the solo piano stuff out that I want to get out. I want to start putting using some of this stuff on on the mm. piano and getting a bit more experimental so maybe zen delay can be involved there yeah you should get one and definitely i think that you know because you can turn any sound into a tapestry with the delay that, yes that's the beauty of it and um going back to that connection between dub and say steve Wright systems music as it's called then which is a lot about phase shifting and sort of rhythms moving across each other with the delay line it's very tempting especially on software like ableton the default is that you have the delays in in sync so if the beats like dum 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 your echoes be echo 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 they're in time with the beat but actually dub records usually don't do that there's no sync in those days you just set the delay time to whatever and so you've got the delay rhythms will cross over the main rhythm and that you get really interesting sort of rhythmic interference from that. That was one of the things I always liked about dub, that it sort of takes you off kilter and takes the rhythm somewhere else for that, those instants where the, the dub splashes effect is engaged. I thought we could play, a, a, I, I noticed you picked a Steve Roach track and he's obviously on the, on the compilation as well. I just yeah. wondered if you, if you had a personal relationship with him. Or... Well, you know, my musical relationships have started off uh, through loving people's work and then getting to know them. I spoke to Adrian Sherwood a couple of days ago. Actually, he just ordered another three Zen delays. <laughs> <laughs> so, he said it's the, um, by, what did he say? By far the best hands-on delay unit he's ever used. So wow. you know, there, nice. there would be no Ninja Tune without Adrian Sherwood. I'd like to just stick my hand up yeah. and say that. Um, so he can have as many as he likes as far as I'm concerned. He's like my, <laughs> pretty proud to say he's like a Cold Cut's older brother now. Adrian Sherwood. So um Yeah, his on his on new sound label uh quite yeah, as that, you say. That was totally, totally a, a blueprint for Ninja Tune, basically, mm -hmm. you know. Um but going back to Steve Roach um and Ninja Tune crossing the states in a tour bus across Middle America, staring out the window, seeing the incredible landscapes, and putting on a mixtape, which my friend Bongo, who's a sort of ambient activist traveller woman. Um, who I worked with quite a lot in the, the 90s. She made this tape and it started off with Structures from Silence. Um, and everyone on the bus was just like hypnotized by this and we just would put it on the repeat and those long drives, it worked perfectly.
I got in touch with Steve when I was looking for contributors to At Zero, um, and he got straight back to me. Um, he's one of the artists, you know, who's probably had experience on different labels, and like us with Ninja Tune, decided it's actually better if you do your own thing and control it yourself. Yeah. So I dropped a message on Bandcamp, and um, uh, actually, then it, what happened to he, he said, "Yeah, I, I like the idea. Um, give me a." while and I'll see what I can do and then so I'm doing this ambient festival um, which is called Sound uh, it'll come to me in a minute um, and uh, I was like oh you know, any slots going he's like no sorry it's booked up at the moment and then a, a, a while later he said actually the slots just opened up at the festival um, can you get? Can you do me a set, an audiovisual set, in, tw- in the next twenty-four hours? <laughs> so, <laughs> an, an hour's set. So, yeah, um, I I did it, and uh, he was really happy with it. And um, and uh, in return, he's provided this wonderful track for their compilation. And um, in fact, of course, Morris turned me on to Steve Roach originally. Impetus that album. I think was the first one I got into. Well, funky, sort of funky, electronic, pulsing ambience without heavy drum beats. He's been doing it for a while. He's an absolute don. Sound Quest, I think, is his festival. And Matt, is there another uh, track you'd like to um, play today? I'd like to hear Simonde, The Message, because come the same era as Ramp, come into knowledge. But, you know, Simonde, a very interesting band because they were a black UK band um, who played funk, but they mixed it up with African and jazz and a bit of reggae, and they're really good musicians. And they're pretty much highly underrated at the time. And they've been having a bit of a moment of shine. And in fact, The Big Chill put them on a good few years ago, which was their first gig for years. But you know, this track was huge on the London Red Groove scene. And that's the scene where I met Jonathan and Cold Cut was birthed from that scene with other people mm-hmm. like Norman Jay was a big part of that as well. And there were certain tracks that were sort of the Red Groove classics that were pretty difficult to get. But um, Simonde, The Message was one of them. Jonathan rather memorably defined rare groove as it's like well how can the jackson five it's great to be there be a rare groove when it was number one said well it's that rare record that has the groove so (laughs) that was a good (laughs) alternative definition and this track i just think is a wonderful uplifting slice of of soul it's funky it's danceable it's uplifting it's got a great message it's sincere it's from the uk uh, it's British black music at a time when that was not really a thing and it stood the test of time and I always smile and sing along when I put this track on and I send this out to everyone as a, the message love is the message as they say. Uh, yeah let's 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 play that and just just final question Matt what's next for you and Cold Cut what can people look forward to well we've been keeping pretty busy actually you know, we've upped the up the rate of releases from one every 10 years to a bit more a bit more brisk. The Keller Ketler the record only came out a couple of years. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, so we've done the Zen Delay, the Midi Evolve, um, and now the At Zero compilation. And I'm say I'm still working on the visual mix for that. Um, I'm not sure what Cold Cut's next move will be, but we're we're working on stuff. We actually did another new track recently, which is called Kiedo Verde. And that's part of In Place of Wars compilation has a sort of rainforest benefit and has my friend Blanca Regina on vocals and the title is inspired by Federico García Llorca, the Spanish poet's uh, poem. Quiero Verde means I love green um, and I need, I need green. And Brian Eno um, was on that release as well, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Martin Ware and Finger Thing. Yes. And a, a, some, a really nice album actually, well worth tracking down. And what about um, a cold cut album? Well, which we'll see. I've actually, I'm more into making a film or some kind of audiovisual piece. Um, Just making an album, I'm not sure what to do, but I'm still really into investigating this idea of audiovisual relationship. Um, I've been reading some really inspiring stuff recently. Uh, Came across this painter, Seri Richards from the UK. He died in, I think, 72, but 
he was a musician as well and it was him who said that you know the relationship between painting and music is a vast field to explore um and i would like to do that and seeing um vicky bennett's uh gone gone beyond work last night at the barbican as it's like that's up to the ante actually as cinematic orchestra man with a movie camera that yeah. film with their live track that up to the ante for audio visual work as well and uh, i want to still get in there and i still i still feel i'm going to do my best work yet that's brilliant if i i like to think at 60 i'll be looking ahead and it's great that you're still inspired and innovating that <laughs> Thank you. And, just uh, getting warmed yeah. up, actually. Yeah, just <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, man. Definitely. Thanks so. Thanks so much for um, talking to me and um, All right, James about your your love of ambient and uh, some little anecdotes on ninja history as well. And um, let's play out on Simonde the message.